Hi all, this is Jan Almighty and welcome to this video. Today we continue with the instructive endgame series and today we start with the topic the centralization of the king. Centralization of the king is a very important topic in the chess endgame series and this is of course why I'm covering it uh, to actually showcase why is it important to centralize your king when you come into the chess endgame. I have chosen this game between two very strong players Hozerol Capablanca, the third world chess champion, and Samuel Reshevsky, one of the strongest American chess grandmasters, and to see how one of them actually uses this idea very correctly to centralize the king and then gain advantage in the endgame, while the other one misses that same idea and then suffers the consequences. So, without further ado, as always, uh, we will start off through the beginning of the game, see the opening, come to the critical point, and then try to analyze the position. So, Cavalanca is once again with the white pieces like in the last video and he starts off with d4. A surprise to me, but probably not to many. d5 and after a couple of moves we do have the queen's gambit accepted. I don't see it that much these days. And Capablanca chooses to capture this pawn with the queen. Nothing wrong with that. And instead of uh, going with the bishop to it, he will develop the bishop on g2. Pretty much uh, good ideas here, and all of a sudden Ryshevsky not doesn't go for the main line here, he plays rook to a7, and we see after bishop to b7 you cannot capture the pawn here, otherwise you would lose the game after bishop to f3, just wanted to cover that quickly, a little bit of uh, opening knowledge also wouldn't hurt, so he brings the queen back to c1. Just after a couple of moves we see that uh, black manages to gain a lot of uh, advantage in the development and his pieces look very good. But uh, Cabablanca, the player that he is, he manages to solidify his defenses and in a couple of moves exchange some pieces and gain equal middle game. Then after a couple of moves uh, some rooks get exchanged and also some pieces. Not much to say there. Um, the game is currently equal and neither of the sides can actually go for something. But after a couple of moves, Capablanca manages to create a weakness in Reyshevsky's position. After capturing with this very strong bishop on d5, Reyshevsky opts out to capture with a pawn. Maybe a bad decision because bishop to d5, there is nothing wrong with this move. So we have pawn captures. Uh, defending the pawn and having all the pawns on dark squares. Very important topic. Motif very when your opponent does have a bishop of the light square, you put your pawns on dark squares. Um, after a couple of moves, more pieces uh, get exchanged. First the queens, and after that the rooks. Uh, neither of the players could have gained throughout this game any serious advantage. And uh, after bishop to c6 and knight to d3, we reach the critical position where I would like to analyze this game. So. Uh, at the moment, we do have a position where uh, the pawn, yeah, the pawn situation is definitely the same. But of course, uh, maybe white is a little bit better having two pawn, two pawn islands while black has three pawn islands. So this is one, this is the second, and this is the third. And just looking at the position, we see that black does have an isolated d5 pawn, which is also a very weak pawn because it's on a light square, the same color of the square of the bishop. So this is something that white can definitely take advantage of. If black would have a dark square bishop, then white would have a lot of trouble actually entering the position. Here, there is a quite clear plan that white can take into advantage. While talking about the centralization of the king, the king can come through one of these four very important squares and from there continue to gain some advantage towards the black end of the board. For example, here, in this position, we see that the the square c5 is a very important square and if white king can manage to get a hold of this square then that would be half the battle, half the war because winning this square and having an eye on this d5 pawn and the b5 pawn definitely would be a great great advantage for white. But of course white isn't the, uh, the one without faults in his position. You can see that these pawns have all advanced forward and uh, that means that black can definitely just in a couple of moves challenge them and maybe create some weaknesses on the, on the king side of the board. And this is how exactly this game starts. G5, I mean starts, uh, the game from this position starts. First G5 uh, and the idea of the G5 move is uh, 
an awesome idea uh, just to create weaknesses in white's camp. So white is pretty much forced to capture here on g5. Otherwise, if he ignores the threat, then pawn captures on h4, pawn captures on h4, and then the king can very calmly come to this side of the board and uh, try to threaten capturing the h pawn, creating himself a border pass pawn, which would be a definite advantage for black in this position. So uh, here Capablanca captures, black captures, and we have knight to b4 attacking the bishop. First pawn captures on b3, pawn captures, bishop moves out of the way, still defends the pawn on d5, and we have g4. A very important move from white's perspective, how to continue the game and how to centralize your king if you don't handle yourself, your weaknesses on on either sides of the board. For example, here uh, the weaknesses that uh, White should have taken account for is, for example, if he doesn't play g4, if he plays king to e2, then definitely h5, but h4 is a big threat. Once again, Black could easily create a pass pawn, and that would be a big advantage for him. So to keep that in mind, Capablanca simply plays g4 here, and now h5 isn't possible anymore. Not just that, even if you try to play h5, pawn can capture. And if you want to play g4, pawn can capture. So there is no way that black can actually create a pass pawn here in this situation. And just by that, white is the only side that can play for a win here. Unless, of course, white doesn't blunder horribly. And keeping that in mind, after g4, we saw king to g7 on the board. King to e2, as, as we said, centralizing the king, coming to these four squares in the center of the board. And why once again? Because, quite simply, you can reach either side of the board very easily and you can come to the battleground quite faster than for example that king isn't in the center of the board and now we come to the critical position in the game Reyshevsky is on the move with the black pieces and he has a, ha, has an option does he want to play king to f6 with the same idea go to the center of the board or does he want to play king to g6 and stay on the edge of the board to maybe create some weaknesses with playing h5 Keep in mind that playing h5 is possible in two ways. Not just that, so uh, king to g6 and then supporting the pawn with the king, but also remaneuvering the bishop, c8, uh, for example, d7, e8, and then pushing h5, or even better, if the knight moves, bishop c6, bishop to e8, and then pushing h5. Those are the two choices, and which choice do you want to choose is up to you. But there is definitely one that is better, and it's in the name of the title, the centralization of the king. Black definitely should have played king to f6 here. And I wanted to go through a couple of moves here, because after king to d3, king reaches e5, center of the board, and you could consider that black has resolved half of his, its issues. And how to continue here? Uh, white doesn't have any clear way how to create a pass pawn, so for example, he could remaneuver the knight. If he plays knight to c2, then bishop to c6, knight to d4, and now moving the bishop all the way to e8. At the same time defending on b5, and also at the same time uh, trying to play h5, and then create some weaknesses on the king side. Now, um, for example, knight to f5 can be played, but that would be a terrible blunder, because after bishop to g6, the knight is pinned, you can either win the pawn or even after e4, pawn captures, pawn captures, king comes to f4 and g4 pawn will be lost. So that is a bad idea, don't go with the knight on this way. The other idea is to use the king, which is go on the other side of the board playing king to c3, but after this h5 is played, pawn captures, or otherwise if you don't capture h4, h3, unstoppable pawn goes to promotion, pawn captures, bishop captures, Cannot capture with the knight because the pawn is attacked, so you have to play king to b4. We have g4, pawn captures, bishop captures, king captures, king to e4. And uh, here in this position it is, uh, okay, it is not that obvious that it is a draw, but after a couple of moves I will quickly show. Black can simply go and capture here. King can capture here, but the main idea is that after bishop to h3, bishop to g2 will always be a threat. This bishop can come on f1 or g2 and stop this pawn sacrifice it for itself and that is a draw so judging by that you see that you have that option keeping the bishop on a8 and creating weaknesses on the king side and keeping the king in the center black is definitely safe so uh, Reshevsky could have gone for that idea but he 
uh, didn't and now we will show why is it uh, so important to have a centralized key and how Capablanca actually shows it in the game. In this position Reshevsky plays king to g6 and opts out for the option to support this pawn with the king. We have king to d3, h5, pawn captures, king captures and king to d4. We see the king is already here and now he will enter c5 at, at an appropriate point and then uh, go and capture this pawns. Of course, that is one option. You don't have to do it uh, depending on what black does. Black, if he goes immediately for g4 here, then it that wouldn't make much sense because pawn captures, king captures knight to d5, and now this pawn will be unstoppable. You will have to give up the bishop for this pawn, but then uh, white can capture the b5 pawn either with the knight or with the king, and he has yet another pawn to promote it to a queen. So here, uh, Ryshevsky plays king to h4 and tries to create a pass pawn of his own. A very good idea. But still, we have knight to d5, king to g3, and now f4. So don't want to give up the pawn that easily. And here, once again, if you capture the pawn, capture the pawn, and bishop captures, king captures, king captures on f4, white is unfortunately for black too fast, and uh, this pawn will go out and be promoted. This is a simple winning endgame where white has a pawn and it's enough for a win. So here, instead of going for that, once again, after f4, Reshevsky opts out for only one possible option with a counterplay, g4. We have f5, and now it's time to, to push the pawns that are uh, the pass pawns. Sorry, bishop to c8, we have king to e5, if f6 immediately then bishop to e6, and it is very hard to push f7 here. So Capablanca plays correctly, king to e5, we have bishop to d7, e4, and now bishop to e8. And here, actually, we have a, a little bit of a turning point. Uh, I'm going to uh, quickly show how Capablanca could have continued and just with a pawn push as simply win this endgame he unfortunately made a mistake that wasn't punished in the end but i wanted to show you this game how you should play it properly until the end uh, here we have f6 as a possible move king to f3 and the whole idea was to play knight to f4 actually here because now the knight is eyeing the g2 square and if the pawn comes from g3 to g2 you could sacrifice the knight for the pawn and then use these two pawns to push one of the pawns to promotion and sacrifice the other for the bishop. So that is the idea. Here after this, for example, even if, uh, for example, you play king to f5, then bishop to d7 is a move. So you have to go back, so that doesn't really make much sense. But okay, after bishop to e8, we have knight to f4, g3, and king to f5. Now after bishop to d7, we can play king to g5, because now the knight is defended. And if the king captures here on e4, f7 and f8 is a queen so uh, here black has to play something else after king to g5 we saw bishop to e6 a very clever move because uh, if you play knight to e6 then g2 but knight to e6 is the best move and you have to enter an end game where you have a knight and a queen to go and win this i will quickly go through the best moves for example g2 f7 g g1 queen and king to f6 there is no time for the queen to come in front of the pawn you can, for example, capture here and exchange queens, but it's very important to see that actually white still wins this endgame, even though the king and the knight are very far away. We have king to d4, knight to e6, king to c3, and knight to c5. Whatever black plays, knight manages in two moves to come to this square, defend the pawn, and if you attack it, the king defends it. Now white will grab this pawn and have another pawn to promote it to a queen. So this would happen if you would go for the queen exchange. If not, if for example, uh, even here after f8 queen, you would go for, for a check, king e7, and then, I don't know, queen a7. There are a couple of checks that you could give, but in the end, the knight covers, and then the white is the one who is on the move. Go for the queen exchange, grab the spawn, whatever happens, white is definitely winning this game. After all, he has a piece more. So... Those are the possibilities and th that is something that could have happened and uh, here after bishop to e8 e f6 was the best move. But here king to d4 was played by Capablanca and the game continues. We have king to f3, we have e5, g3 and now the knight doesn't come on f4 but on e3 and still defends the g2 pawn. And here Reshevsky could have found the best move which would lead him to a draw which is bishop to f7. 
and uh, here moves like e6 uh, are met with bishop to g8. Now the idea is that you cannot play f6 because this pawn would fall and if you play e7 then bishop to f7 and now this bishop holds both of the pawns because he manages to uh, create some weaknesses on the light squares. On the other hand you cannot bring the knight closer because g2 and g1 are is too fast and you cannot bring the king closer because you will lose the knight. This is a possible way how to go for a draw, but Reshevsky missed that and he played king to f4. Capablanca now continues with e6, we have g2, knight captures on g2 with check, king captures on f5 and this pawn is defended. Not just that the pawn is defended, but at the same time the king cannot come closer to this side of the board and maybe capture this pawn. After king to g4 we have knight to e3, king to f4 and king to d4. After this Reshevsky resigned the game and the game ended. As, um, as usual um, I will go back uh, to the critical moment in the game which was just a second give me a second after knight to d3 so this was the initial one and here after king to g7 king to g6 has been played but king to f6 is a clear draw after both of the kings try to go for centralized squares e5 e4 d5 and d4 very important topic and very important thing to learn the idea of centralizing king in the end game is very important and when you think about it quite clear uh, when you're in the opening and when you're in the middle game it is very important to keep your king safe because there are a lot of pieces on the board and there are a lot of pieces that can actually checkmate you as you slowly progress towards the end of the game uh, it, is, it makes more sense to include the king into the game because having less and less pieces on the board king is the very important piece that is missing the initial opening and middle game strategy um, that is the topic that I wanted to talk about today of course uh, up at this point uh, we are moving into a territory actually analyzing the game so yeah even the first 10 minutes of the video which I will mention um, in the comments and in the description will be enough to actually cover the whole topic but later on I decided to analyze the game up until the end. Uh, that being said I will continue with this series uh, first with a couple of more games on the centralization of the king topic and later on with something else. That being said my name is Jan Almighty I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Enjoy!